Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is the disorders of lymphatic vessels. Since this is a big chapter, I will not be able to complete the whole chapter in one lecture. So I have divided this topic into two parts. So today will be the first part of the lecture that would be covering half of the chapter. So this lecture starts with introduction. Since as the disease, as the topic signifies, it is a disorder of lymphatic vessels. So we will be discussing all those conditions which are associated with some dysfunction in lymphatic drainage or uh, lymphatic flow. So the lymphatic dysfunction interferes with fluid homeostasis, tissue immunity, and peripheral fat mobilization. These are the th three functions of lymphatics. That is to maintain the homeostasis in the fluid and to uh, bring the different immune cells to the inflammatory sites and the peripheral fat mobilization. Any chronic edema that represents lymphatic failure. If impaired lymphatic drainage is solely responsible, then lymph edema results. And this lymph edema produces characteristic skin changes, which are known as elephantiasis when it is intense. The impaired immune cell trafficking results in increased risk of infection. This is the second function of lymphatics and particularly cellulitis or erysipelas, which often become recurrent. So if uh, this lymph drainage is affected, then because of uh, the less recruitment of anti-inflammatory cells to the affected site, there is a chance of getting frequent infections, particularly cellulitis or erysipelas. The clinical presentation of lymphatic dysfunctions. The first is the chronic lymph edema or drug-induced edema. Edema is an excess of interstitial fluid. Any edema is due to either capillary filtration, either due to increased capillary filtration or insufficient lymphatic drainage for a period of time. So there is an imbalance between the excessive filtration of fluid in the interstitium and decreased absorption of fluid from the interstitium. And the examples are heart failure, venous diseases, and nephrotic syndrome. These are few medical conditions which are associated with either increased filtration or increased filtration mainly. Edema arising principally from failure of lymphatic drainage is the lymph edema, or the which is because of absolute lymphatic failure. Introduction and general description. It is important to determine if edema is due to fluid or another tissue component. There are other causes of swelling, localized or diffuse swelling. One of those is uh, the overgrowth syndromes, which include the Clipper-Tenoni syndrome, in which there is excess of bone, fat or muscles with or without additional fluid. A plexiform neurofibroma or neurofibromatosis may cause tissue swelling from both neural tumor and because of lymph edema. So a better approach is to consider edema representing a pure lymphatic drainage failure overwhelmed by increased capillary filtration. Most cases of chronic edema have more than one factor contributing. So consequently, the treatment should be uh, either to enhance the lymphatic drainage, drainage and address any fac factor which causes increased infiltration. So these two factors will be playing part of lymphatic edema of whatever is the cause. So when we are discussing different diseases in the chapter, you will be you will keep in mind of these two factors. That is either increase in filtration of fluid in the interstitium and decrease in lymphatic drainage because of any other reason. There are causes, different causes of chronic edema due to increase in capillary filtration. So increase in capillary filtration will um, cause, uh, is, will be because of increase in capillary pressure. The increase in capillary pressure is uh, indirectly due to increase in venous pressure. 
So increase in venous pressure occurs in right heart failure, in um, in DVTs, in venous obstructions, if by use of calcium channel antagonists and prolonged dependency or over transfusion. So all these causes uh, factors causes increase in venous pressure, which then causes the increase in capillary pressure. And this uh, increased capillary pressure also cause increase in blood flow, which uh, is seen in inflammation and in atriovenous fistulas. Then another reason of increased fluid filtration is because of decrease in plasma proteins. Uh, because of uh, loss of plasma proteins due in nephrotic syndrome and in protein losing enteropathies, or decrease in synthesis of plasma proteins as we see in cirrhosis liver, in advanced cancers, in malabsorptions and malnutrition. So when the protein content of the serum is low, the fluid tends to move out because of uh, osmosis. Then the third factor which causes increased filtration is increase in capillary permeability. And the capillaries become more porous due, uh, due to inflammation, uh, which can be uh, skin-related inflammation like eczemas, like psoriasis, chronic skin infections, urticarias, angioedemas, and several drugs. So these are the three causes of increased capillary filtration. Then, what are the causes of decrease or reduced lymphatic drainage? Um, there can be a primary lymphatic insufficiency or secondary lymphatic insufficiency. The primary lymphatic insufficiency means some genetic disorders like uh, Milroy's disease, uh, lymphedema, and dystic, uh, dyst, uh, dyst, um, dystichiasis. Then, because of unknown gene, there is a primary lymphatic failure, which is called as the Meeks disease. Then, some mosaic mutations are caused, seen in lymphatic malformation and overgrowth spectrums. Then there are secondary lymphatic insufficiencies, which can be itrogenic, and the itrogenic causes include surgery and radiotherapy. Uh, secondary lymphatic insufficiency is due to cancers and due to infections like filariasis and cellulitis, some accidental trauma to lymphatics, uh, gross obesity, gross immobility, and sustained lymph load which is seen in venous diseases, heart failures, and venous obstruction and DVT, and secondary lymphatic insufficiencies. These are all causes of secondary lymphatic insufficiencies. If the lower limb edema is unilateral or asymmetrical, then local factors need to be considered, like pelvic lymph or venous obstruction, post-thrombotic syndrome, or inflammation from dermatitis or infection. The weight of a huge abdominal apron causes obstruction of lymph and venous drainage in thigh and groin where, when the patient is sitting. Then poor mobility results in no enhancement of lymphatic drainage. Sitting with leg dependent causes periods of high venous pressure and consequently high microvascular fluid infiltration. Falling asleep in a chair without leg elevation is particularly bad, which is seen in old age, neglected patients, uh, alcoholics, etc. Sleep apnea syndrome leads to periods of arterial and pulmonary hypertension and fluid retention. These all are the causes which contribute. Lymph lymphedema is an uncommon lymphatic insufficiency and is a major contributing cause of chronic ankle edema, particularly in elderly. It is difficult to diagnose, particularly if mild. Therefore, it is frequently underdiagnosed. Pathophysiology. This edema, as I explained before, developed because of uh, microvascular increase, microvascular filtration, uh, which exceeds the lymphatic drainage. For edema to develop either the microvascular, microvascular filtration rate is high or lymph flow is low or combination of both the two factors. Clinical features. Lymphedema does not usually respond to elevation of uh, foot or to diuretics, except in early stages when it is compounded by increase in capillary filtration. So increase in capillary filtration can be 
that does respond to elevation and diuretic, but decreased lymphatic flow does not. So chronic edema that does not reduce significantly after overnight elevation is likely to be of lymphatic origin and not of venous origin. Then chronic edema associated with bacterial cellulitis indicates that lymphatic role in tissue um, indicates the lymphatic uh, role in tissue immunosurveillance, which is being compromised. A number of drugs causes chronic edema, which include the most important are the calcium channel blockers, with amylodipine is one of the worst offender. Other drugs which cause um, increased lymphedema are corticosteroid, uh, texanes, NSAIDs, uh, clonidine, morphine, gabapentine, ol olazepam, and um, uh, premipexol and thiazolidine downs. Thia, th uh, interstitial fluid volume must increase by over 100% before edema is clinically detectable through pitting or indentation of the skin. So you need to have a lot of increase in interstitial fluid volume for the edema to be clinically apparent. Then dermal edema manifests as this is an interstitial fluid edema. If the edema is seen in the dermis, that is superficially, then it manifests as putty orange due to expansion of interfollicular dermis, whereas subcutaneous edema give rise to pitting. So now we are dealing with two kinds of edema. If edema is superficial, that is, it is in the dermis, then it would give a putty orange appearance, which is seen in breast malignancies. If edema is in the subcutaneous tissue, then it would give rise to diffuse swelling with pitting or non-pitting. Lymphedema differs from other edemas in which increased capillary filtration is the major factor in that proteins and fat accumulate in addition to water. So if lymphedema is due is only because of increase in filtration, you will not see the presence of proteins, cells and fat. Um, but if the edema is due to lymphatic failure, then in addition to the fluid, fat cells, fats, uh, proteins and cells will accumulate in the interstitium. And this, this lymph and edema result in solid as well as a fluid component to the swelling, so giving rise to the brawny nature of edema, which does not readily pit except in early stages. So this the this is the explanation of non-pitting nature of lymphedema. That is, the lymphedema contain both the fluid as well as the solid component. The solid component is because of the cells, protein, and fat, and that's why it gives a uh, indurated and brawny indurated um, feel on uh, palpation and uh, non-pitting kind of edema. The lack of pitting is an unreliable sign in lymphedema, although early displacement of tissue fluid on pressure can often be demonstrated, particularly in the early stages. With time, the skin thickens in lymphedema and becomes more warty. A positive Kaposi stammer sign represents a failure to pinch the fold of skin at the base of second toe and is pathognomic of lymphedema. So this sign should be demonstrated by every one of you if you get a patient of lymph edema in your exam. That is the Kaposi stammer sign. It is done by, by pinching the fold of the skin on the second toe and uh, you would not be able to pick, uh, pinch the skin because of the lymph edema. In circumstances where the cause of chronic edema is not obvious, a search for reason for high microvascular fluid filtration should be pursued. For example, see the uh, raised GVP, which signifies a heart failure, and look for local in local inflammation from dermatitis or infection or low plasma proteins in the lower limb. Sign of venous diseases uh, causing venous hypertension must be sought. And the signs of uh, venous hypertension include varicose veins, then hemocytin deposition, particularly in submalleolar region, then varicose eczema or atrophy blanchy like lesions. Investigations. If increased microvascular filtration is suspected, 
then following should be considered and investigated. Number one, causes of high central venous pressure, that is heart failure. Uh, B, type neuro... Um, a new tree uret uretic peptide BNP estimation is a use, use, useful screening test for heart failure. Its normal levels rule out acute heart failure. So this is a new thing. The B type uh, net tree uret uretic peptide or BNP. Then plasma albumin should be measured. And if they are low, uh, search for loss. For example, nephrotic syndrome or failure of synthesis, for example, a liver disease, malabsorption or malnutrition. Then look for um, local inflammation. This will increase microvascular filtration and local inflammation include infection, eczema or underlying arthritis. Lymphos, um, lympho uh, Scintiography is done, which is an isotope lymphography. It involves the interstitial dermis and subcutaneous tissue with injection of radio labeled protein or colloid. Radioactivity is measured by the gamma cameras. And measurement of the transit time and time activity curve permits a quantitative analysis of lymphatic drainage. Measurement of tracer uptake within axillary or ileoinguinal lymph nodes at a specific time will discriminate lymphedema from edema of non-lymphatic origin. Imaging. The imaging which can be done in case of lymphedema is CT scan of lymphedematous limb which demonstrate characteristic honeycomb pattern in the subcutaneous compartments which other edemas do not show. So thickening of skin is also a characteristic feature of lymphedema, although it is not specific. The honeycomb pattern is more specific. MRI is potentially better than CT scan to, distinguishing, to distinguish the type of edema. Then comes the management. Venous edema uh, resulting from venous hypertension causing excessive microvascular filtration and it must be remembered that lymphatics are and not the veins that are responsible for drainage of the tissue fluid. So if the lymph drainage is compensating, no matter how severe the venous disease is, there will be no edema. So the surgical treatment of varicose veins will often not resolve the venous edema uh, because the lymphatic drainage is compromised and surgery will not improve. Uh, indeed, it may reduce it. So, uh, it is first, it is important to determine whether uh, the edema is only because of the venous disease and if it is because of venous hypertension, because of increase in filtration, if we correct that venous hypertension by treating the varicose veins, the edema fluid, if it won't, uh, it is not 100% cure, it will be much better. Therefore, Compression is the treatment of choice for venous edema before because compression garments hosiery have an advantage of reducing the microvascular filtration of venous hypertension while at the same time improving the drainage. However, this compression cannot be. Um, however, this compression has to be done uh, on a regular basis for a prolonged period of time. So the idea would be better if uh, the surgery is done followed by compression. In case of drug-induced edema, for example, by amlodipine, drug should be replaced and empiric use of diuretics should be discouraged as it is often ineffective because it's always a compromise of lymphatic drainage. Swelling of one leg, leg points to the local causes of venous obstruction from vein compression or from DVT. Lymphatic obstruction usually produce whole limb swelling that is burst proximally rather than Distally. Genital edema occurring in isolation. We will discuss genital edema in detail. So if occur uh, in isolation is a usually result of local inflammation. For example, infection, anogenital granulomatosis like cutaneous Crohn's, hydra adenitis suppurativa or sarcoidosis. It can be a part of more widespread edema from heart failure or nephrotic syndrome. The primary lymphedema can affect the genitalia, but usually without the lower limb involvement. Lymph or chylus reflux 
can produce genital edema often with lymph and geactasis. That is a weeping lymph blister. So these all are the features of chronic lymph edema. Upper limb edema is much less common than lower limb edema and usually result from either proximal venous obstruction, that is the thoracic outlet syndrome or some inflammatory disorder due to infection, arthritis or eosinophilic fasciitis. Then the second uh, topic of today's lecture is the chronic swollen leg. In this topic, we are going to discuss other causes of chronic swollen leg than the lymphedema. Swelling of leg may cause may be caused by edema, in which case pitting should be evident to some degree, or it may be caused by an increased volume of other tissue element, for example, bone, muscle or fat as we see in uh, hypertrophy syndromes. So the cause of swollen legs is often multifactorial. Therefore, patients' individual history and appropriate physical examination are both important. Other differentials to consider in case of chronic swollen leg is the ruptured Baker cyst, infection, trauma, and malignancy. Inflammation of joint or periarticular st structures may cause edema that is not primarily vascular. MRI is useful in circumstances where nature of swelling is uncertain. A patient may perceive one leg to be swollen when in fact the other leg has become smaller. For example, a trophy of muscle or fat. So this is another paradox that the patient uh, comes with a complaint of swelling of one leg, uh, but the swelling is not present in that leg, rather the other leg is atrophic due to some condition. The pathophysiology. All edema is caused by the same principle that is increase in microvascular filtration which exceeds the lymphatic drainage. And causes of microvascular fluid filtration we will discuss again that is the increased venous pressure due to chronic venous insufficiency or post-thrombotic syndrome, venous obstruction or heart failure, hypoproteinemias or increased vascular permeabilities. In case of obesity and in infirmity, lymph drainage roots of the leg are patent but non-functional due to lack of mobility, uh, for example, arthritis. So the um, pumps in the um, calf muscles are important to assist the lymphatic drainage, which will be inactive if there is prolonged immobility. Sitting for long period without moving cause sustained venous hypertension, increased fluid filtration, and poor lymph drainage. A large obese abdominal apron pressing on thighs while sitting will obstruct the venous flow. Sleep apnea syndrome have explained before, it will result in fluid retention due to high heart chamber pressures. The clinical features of uh, swollen leg include, indicates uh, primarily a lymphatic cause, that is a persistent swelling, which can be intermittent at first, the edema that does not resolve with overnight elevation and poor resistance to diuretic or recurrent cellulitis in that leg. So if these features are present, then this chronic swollen leg is because of lymphedema. Then chronic non-inflammatory asymmetrical lower limb edema should always suggest a cause within the hind quarter. That is some chronic venous hypertension or lymphedema. Systemic causes of edema include the cardiac disease, renal disease, hyperproteinemia, we have already explained before. And we have also explained before that lymphedema characteristically produce a thickened skin with uh, increased chronicity, the skin changes becomes hyperkeratotic and papillomatosis, which is giving an elephantiasis look. Then failure to pinch the fold of skin on second toe is the Kaposi stammer sign, which is pathognomic of lymphedema, should always be demonstrated in the exam. In more advanced cases, fat deposition and fibrosis lead to more indurated or brawny swelling that result in bulging fold of skin and subcutaneous tissue. The chronically swollen leg usually indicates lipodermatosclerosis, which, which we are going to explain later. So this is a Kaposi stammer sign. You see the thick 
papillomatous and hyperkeratotic skin and the skin cannot be pinched uh, by pressure on the second toe. Investigations. Uh, blood tests are important to exclude hypoproteinemias, to exclude the heart failure. Um, the measurement of plasma, albumin and BNP should be done to um, rule out the acute heart failures. Then imaging should be done. We have explained before lymphangiocentography to confirm the lymphatic etiology, venous duplex ultrasound to see where there is a venous reflux. A skin biopsy may be necessary if uh, malignancies like Kaposi sarcoma, pre-tibial mixed edema or malignancies are considered. Management in circumstances where the systemic cause for peripheral edema, that is the heart failure, have led to or coexist with lymph edema, then treatment of internal medical conditions must be undertaken before embarking on specific lymph edema therapy. The general principle of treating a swollen lip is to control the increased microvascular filtration and to enhance the lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic drainage responds to exercise, uh, movement, and wearing compression garments. The third topic is phleboedema or mixed lymphovenous disease. So now we are discuss, going to discuss conditions in which both the venous and lymphatic drainage are playing its part. The phlebolymphedema or mixed lymphovenous disease is mixed etiology disease arising from chronic venous hypertension leading to increased microvascular fluid filtration that overwhelms the lymphatic drainage. The lymphedema that is associated with venous disease can give rise to more gross swelling of the and the skin changes owing to the combined effect of impaired lymphatic drainage and increased lymphatic load. Phlebolymphedema occur elsewhere on the body, for example, in pendulous abdomen, in large pendulous breasts, and upper limb venous outflow obstructions. Pathophysiology is almost the same. It requires increased venous pressure to increase fluid movement out of the blood vessels, that is filtration. In lower limb, this may be caused by varicose vein, DVT or venous obstructions. Because of calf muscle pump, it is important for venous drainage. Long period spent with leg, leg dependent, therefore subject patient to gravitational forces causes sustained period of venous hypertension and fluid filtration. So the immobility tends to encourage the swelling, which is also called as the dependency syndrome. A common scenario is arm, chair, legs. When patients sit in a chair day and night with their legs dependent, otherwise known as elephantiasis, uh, nostress, verrucosa, because of the severe lymphedema skin changes. Patient at risk are those with neurological deficits in the leg, with chronic respiratory or cardiac disease, those with sleep apnea syndrome who cannot lie flat. Obesity is one of the predisposing factors uh, with the large abdomen compressing on thigh veins when sitting upright on the chair. So the calcium channel blockers causes lymphedema and should be discontinued. Traditional surgical stripping of varicose veins or harvesting of great saphenous vein for coronary bypass grafting could also damage the leg lymphatics and lead to phlebolymphedema. Intravenous drug abuse can damage both veins and lymphatics from both thrombosis and sepsis, leading to phleboedema in the upper and lower limbs. Intravenous drug abuse can damage both veins and lymphatics from both thrombosis and sepsis, leading to phleboedema in the upper or the lower limbs. Many primary lymphedemas for which gene mutations are known also possess some venous reflux because of genetically determined venous valve failure. The best documented is lymphedema dystichiasis syndrome, 
where the mutation is in a FOXC2 gene. The clinical features of phlebolymphedema in lower limb will start with the pitting edema, which is indistinguishable from other chronic edemas with history of varicose veins that include a past venous surgery, a deep vein thrombosis, heart failure, obesity, or infirmity with long period stem spent with leg dependent. Symptoms of chronic venous wow. disease, I am uh, repeating again, are the heaviness on the, in the legs, aching, itching from varicose dermatitis, then skin pigmentation from purpura and hemosiderin deposition. Symptoms worsen towards the end of the day and relieved by overnight elevation and usually exacerbated by heat and alcohol. So this is lymphedema associated with chronic venous disease. You can see the chronic venous eczema in this case. Lipodermatosclerosis will often produce severe pain and tenderness. Poor wound healing can result in chronic ulcers. When lymphedema dominates the picture, the skin becomes harder and swelling does not resolve as much with overnight elevation. So initially it is the venous edema, now it is the lymphatic edema. Then recurrent cellulitis always indicates lymphatic insufficiency. Such infections will cause local signs of inflammation like pain, redness, heat and swelling. These signs can be confused with acute on chronic lipodermatosclerosis. Edema is usually confined Edema is usually confined to below knee, but severe cases can extend into the thighs. When signs of lymphedema dominate, then tissue will be indurated and pitting is more difficult to elicit. So once the venous edema changes to lymphatic edema, the tissue will become thickened and pitting, non, and pitting edema will change to non-pitting edema. Then Kaposi's tumor sign will be positive. Advanced cases develop elephantiasis skin changes with hyperkeratosis and papillomatosis. Lipodermatosclerosis, however, does not cause systemic upset and increase white cell count or CRP or respond to antibiotics. The complications. Phleboedema is complicated by lymph lipodermatosclerosis, I've um, told again and again, by complicated by dermatitis, which is called as the varicose eczema, then ulceration called as venous ulcers, lymphoria infections, especially the recurrent cellulitis. Rarely, malignancy or lymph angiosarcoma can complicate phleboedema. Prognosis is poor regarding long-term morbidity unless underlying cause is addressed. Compression therapy with exercise is the only satisfactory treatment and as obvious, it requires a lifelong maintenance. Investigations. Venous duplex ultrasound is investigation of choice for chronic venous disease. Then in case of mixed vascular malformation and iliac vein obstruction, venography may be necessary. Lymphangiosyncography is investigation of choice for lymphatic insufficiency. Management. The first line management is compression and exercise, both for venous disease and lymph lymphatic disease. Compression is achieved through bandaging or compression garments. The standard venous ulcer will require this bandaging and treatment. And uh, the four foot swelling, um, if there is marked four foot swelling or swelling extend beyond the knee, then decongestive lymphatic therapy is preferred. Wound, dermatitis and infection need to be treated before or at the same time as the compression is applied. Exercise is to be encouraged in preference to rest or resting. Legs should be elevated to the heart levels. Patients should be discouraged from spending too long on the chair. Uh, and in infirm patients, pneumatic compression therapy is useful. Second line treatment of venous reflux, uh, superficial venous reflux uh, is the endovenous therapy. Hopefully this will reduce the lymphatic load and reduce the edema but often it's still necessary to wear compression garments. 
So the next topic is a very important topic, which is lipodermatosclerosis, which is also known as the chronic cellulitis. Lipodermatosclerosis is an inflammatory condition of the skin and subcutaneous tissue affecting the lower third of the leg and is commonly, although incorrectly, called as the chronic cellulitis. So chronic cellulitis is not the correct term, but it is a common, common term. Lipodermatosclerosis is due to sustained congestion and that is high interstitial fluid and venous pressure. It is almost usually described with chronic venous disease. While it resembles the bacterial cellulitis, there are no systemic symptoms or signs of infection. Many patients diagnosed with bacterial cellulitis do not have infection and therefore antibiotic treatment is inappropriate in such cases. The true bacterial cellulitis presents with local redness, heat, pain and swelling at one side, usually one leg, combined with systemic upsets like fever or flu-like symptoms. In addition, the inflammatory markers uh, will be elevated, includes, including uh, TLC and CRP. And this will decrease after an appropriate antibiotic therapy. While in lipodermatosclerosis is usually bilateral, there is no systemic symptoms, no raised inflammatory marker, and a response to antibiotic therapy is poor. Epidemiology. Most patients are aged, that is more than 75 years. Pathophysiology. It's caused by lymphedema, chronic venous disease, dependency, immobility, and cellulitis. Clinical features. Lipodermatosclerosis is usually bilateral. While redness and edema are always present, warmth is usually but not always present. So it will not be warm like in cellulitis. And it will be bilateral. In duration indicates that underlying tissue are involved with inflammatory process also called as the sclerosing paniculitis. Pain and tenderness are ever present but not itch and systemic symptoms and signs are absent. There are two forms of lipodermatosclerosis, acute or chronic. The acute lipodermatosclerosis simulates cellulitis with a flare of local redness, heat, and pain. With time, the chronic form supervenes, and now the skin becomes bound down and retracted as the subcutaneous tissue become more fibrotic and contract. So as the subcutaneous tissue becomes fibrotic and it contracts, the skin and dermis and epidermis becomes bound down and uh, to the underlying uh, muscle or bone. Eventually, redness gives rise to brown pigmentation and the leg counter take on the inverted champagne bottle shape. Pitting edema will continue to exist both above and below the area of lipodermatosclerosis. So you can see this area of champagne bottle, neck. Then pitting edema is seen here and here. The differential diagnosis is acute cellulitis. Complications include lymphoria, infection and ulceration. Investigation. Lipodermatosclerosis is a clinical diagnosis. Biopsy will only reveal the changes of stasis dermatitis together with fibrotic paniculitis. Furthermore, biopsy may induce ulceration, which will be poor to heal. Management. Management of lipodermatosclerosis include the first line management is the compression therapy. It may not be tolerated if affected tissue is inflamed and tender. In such circumstances, it is necessary to start with bed rest or even topical steroids before introducing gentle compression. Bandaging may have to be continued until more normal contour is shape is obtained. Second line treatment is if superficial venous reflux is proven or duplex ultrasound, then endovenous therapy, for example, radiofrequency vein ab uh, ablation, laser vein ablation or foam sclerotherapy should be administered. The endovenous therapy is considered unsuitable when traditional ligation or stripping of superficial veins could be undertaken. Then uh, the next topic to discuss is the recurrent cellulitis. Lymphedema, 
or leg ulcer provide the greatest risk for cellulitis, particularly recurrent cellulitis. The cause I have already explained that is because of decrease in the transfer of immunely competent cells to the infection site, so they are unable to restrict the infection. In recurrent cellulitis, the damage to lymphatics may make the lymphedema worse, so predisposing yet further episode of infection. In filarial lymphedema, episode of infections referred to as acute dermatolymphangioadenitis, but to all intents and purposes, the same as cellulitis cause acute morbidity and increasing lymphedema. The risk factor of lymphedema need to be addressed if recurrence is to be averted. Penicillin is effective in preventing subsequent attack, but protective effect diminishes progressively once the drug therapy is stopped. Pathophysiology is, of course, the impaired lymph drainage, leading to high rates of infection uh, in that lymphatic basin. The afferent lymphatic vasculature provides the major exit route from the skin for soluble antigens and for the immunologically active cells, that is the lymphocytes, the dendritic cells and macrophages. This is likely to be disturbed. This likely, uh, it is likely that disturbance in this immune cell trafficking compromise tissue immune surveillance and predispose to infection. The causative organisms, most episodes of cellulitis are believed to be caused by group A streptococcus or staphylococcus aureus. Clinical features, when associated with established lymphedema, the clinical features may differ from classical cellulitis. Onset may be in minutes as opposed to hours in case of classical cellulitis. Toxicity may be severe with flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, headache and high fever. Systemic symptoms may occur before the localizing signs. Episodes may be slow to resolve with oral antibiotics. The recurrence of infection is not unusual after only one week of stopping the antibiotics. So all these are different from the classical cellulitis. That is the rapidity of signs and symptoms to develop, uh, more systemic upset, poor response to antibiotics and frequent recurrence in cellulitis that is associated with breast cancer-related lymphedema, patient may complain only of tiredness and not feeling very well. Local signs may be redness and swelling with flare-up of redness from the time to time. This is a recurrent cellulitis of breast tissue. The main differential diagnosis is DVT or necrotizing fasciitis, lipodermatosclerosis and paniculitis. Uh, but we have already explained the, uh, the salient features of cellulitis. Investigations include blood culture and positive in only 10% of the cases. Then microbiology of any cut or break in the skin or aspiration of blister fluid should be considered uh, before antibiotic is started. Management. The cellulitis is best managed by antibiotics, uh, which is likely to reduce the chances of recurrences. Low-dose prophylactic penicillin, which is phenoxymethyl penicillin 250 mg twice daily for a period of 12 months, almost halves the risk of recurrence. However, the level of protection appears to be sustained for several months after the end of prophylactic therapy. Patient with high BMI, 33 or high, uh, multiple previous episodes of cellulitis of lymphedema of leg, has a reduced likelihood to respond to this prophylaxis. If patient is allergic to penicillin, then alternates include erythromycin. Now, the next topic to consider is a swollen arm. Like swollen leg, the swelling of, swelling of upper limb or extremity is invariably due to edema, but overgrowth of tissue should also be considered. Edema is likely to be lymphatic insufficiency, for example, in breast cancer treatment or from venous obstruction. It may be caused by increased volume of other tissue components like bone, muscle, fat or tumor. Secondary lymphedema can be caused by rheumatoid arthritis, 
सुरेटिक आर्थ्रोपैथी हैंड डेमोटाइटस येलो नेल सिंड्रोम क्रॉनिक रीजनल पेन सिंड्रोम प्री टिबियल मिक्स एडिमा साइरोलिमस ट्रीटमेंट और फॉलोइंग रिपीटेड इन्फेक्शन लाइक सेलोलाइटिस और लिम्फेंजाइटिस एपिडीमियोलॉजी मोर देन वन इन फाइव वेमेन हुई ब्रेस्ट कैंसर विल डिवेलप आर्म लिम्फेडीम The pathophysiology is increased at the venous outflow obstruction. Leading may be due to axillary or subclavian vein compression or stenosis due to malignancy or radiation damage or from occlusion from thrombosis. It occurs particularly in cancer patients receiving chemotherapy through central venous lines. it can also have a primary cause like some anatomical abnormalities including thoracic outlet syndrome or paget shorter syndrome also known as effort thrombosis then arteriovenous fistula uh, done for hemodialysis also increase arm size from an increased blood flow but arm edema will only occur with thrombosis or if lymph drainage is compromised positive factor include recurrent infection from herpes simplex non infective forms include the chronic hand dermatitis rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthropathy genetic factors also contribute like uh, uh, like mutations in ccbe1 fat4 and cjc mutations clinical features the upper limb breast cancer related lymphedema exhibit pitting edema but in more advanced stages fat and fibrosis contribute to swelling so the consistency of swelling may be fatty or firm in some patients hand may be swollen while other hand may be spared despite more proximal swelling of the forearm and upper arm by pinching up the skin and subcutis of each arm between fingers and thumb the thickened ipsilateral tissue can be palpated skin color is normal except in presence of venous outflow obstruction where it is red or blue in that limb when infection is suspected then the skin color is pink to red and with lipodermatosclerosis it is deep red to cherry red differential diagnosis other causes of swelling arm is overgrowth um which is associated lymphedema or lymphatic malformations there may be overgrowth of fat as in lipohypertrophy as with lip lipoedema and with lipomatosis other uh, differentials to consider are musculoskeletal disorders like ruptured muscle myofasciitis polymyositis infection trauma and neoplasms which include sarcomas and carcinomas the systemic causes of swollen limb upper limb is heart failure superior vena cava obstruction and hypoproteinemia complications the main complication of lymphedema anywhere is infection and particularly cellulitis tense lymphedema produce lymphangiectasis uh, that surface as lymph blisters that weep lymph which is called as lymphoria rarely lymphangiosarcoma can complicate lymphedema prognosis uh, again cellulitis investigation lymphedema is usually a clinical diagnosis in context of past cancer treatment however imaging of axilla is necessary to exclude the relapse of cancer for example breast cancer or melanoma then lymphangiosyntography may be done venous duplex ultrasound is done ct or mri venography may be necessary management in circumstances where systemic causes for example cancer recurrence or heart failure is suspected then treatment of that particularly medical condition should be embarked before specific lymphedema therapy the general principles of treating a swollen limb is to limit increase microvascular filtration and enhance lymphatic drainage as this rule apply everywhere the lymphatic drainage respond to exercise and movements done while wearing compression surgical decompression and venous angioplasty 
may be considered for thoracic outlet obstruction. And typical treatment of primary subclavian vein, vein thrombosis is oral anticoagulants alone. Then venous compression or stenosis may be benefit may benefit from stenting. The topic now to discuss is swelling, swelling of face, head and neck region. So we have discussed the swelling of the legs. We have discussed the swelling of the arm. Now we are going to discuss the causes in which we find swelling on the head and neck region and face. Facial swelling may be generalized or localized. For example, it can only restrict to eyelids, lips or one cheek. It may extend beyond the face to involve the head or the neck. If it is chronic, then it, if it is more than three months old, then it will be labeled as chronic. Then the chronic swelling of face is most often due to fluid edema, but can also arise due to Increase in other components such as blood vessels in port wine stain, uh, acromegaly, then overgrowth spectrum, hemihypertrophy or tumors. This edema may extend beyond the face and involve head and neck. The head and neck lymphedema may be categorized as involving external structures like skin and soft tissue or internal structures such as mucosa, pharynx or larynx. So both kinds of edema occur, the external or internal. Lymphedema is frequent late effect of head and neck cancers like angiosarcomas or Kaposi sarcoma. Edema of lower lip, upper or lower lip or both, may be from due to vascular anomaly, recurrent angioedema, orofacial granulomatosis, sarcoidosis, infective chelitis, or after administration of lip fillers. Then chronic edema of eyelids may be due to dermatomyositis, Graves' disease, and particularly rosacea or acne. Eyelid swelling may be due to acquired lax skin from photoaging or blepharochilic Bephlochaliasis. Edema of ear. The chronic inflammatory disorders involving the in ear include rosacea, psoriasis, eczema, cellulitis, pediculosis, trauma, and primary congenital lymphedema all lead to damaged regional lymphatics. Rosaceous enlargement of pinna is called as otophyma. If the primary facial lymphedema occurs, it is invariably present at birth. It is usually asymmetrical and associated with lymphedema elsewhere. The head and neck lymphedema occurring in utero may regress by birth, but can leave signs like prominent medial epicanthic fold or neck whipping postnatally as seen in Turner's and Noonan syndrome. A lymphatic malformation or lymph angioma of head and neck region is more common than lymph edema and give rise to swelling from lymph fluid present within abnormally formed lymphatics. The mouth and particularly tongue are the common sites. This is a picture of solid facial edema. The severe lymphedema following treatment for carcinoma of tongue result in gross um, lower eyelid swellings. Inflammatory disorders considered to cause facial edema include long-standing eczemas, psoriasis, infections, pediculosis, trauma like cauliflower ears and contact allergies or angioedemas. The medical conditions leading to facial edema including dermatomyositis, Cushing syndromes, Graves' disease, and renal disease if associated with hypoproteinemia like nephrotic syndrome. Another cause of facial edema is orofacial granulomatosis, which is difficult to identify granulomas on biopsy, but however, its absence does not exclude this diagnosis. 
if present a dag if present also called as the granulomatous chelitis or melkerson rosenthal syndrome but it remains unclear if the granulomas are the cause or effect of this facial edema or thorough search for gastrointestinal crohn's disease or systemic sarcoidosis should also be made in patient with long standing chronic facial edema the clinical features of facial lymphedema depends on underlying etiology swelling usually affect the central forehead periocular skin and cheek where it may be surprisingly asymmetrical erythema is always present in rosacea but inflammatory pustules and papules may be conspicuous by their absence uh the orofacial granulomas uh start with intermittent bouts of swelling that resembles angioedema affecting lips and cheek but with time the condition becomes persistent and chronic extension of edema within the mouth is common and the reason for the rugose changes on the buccal mucosa and tongue which is called as the scrotal tongue management in include uh, the uh, addressing the particular cause any inflammation should be treated raising the head of the bed during overnight sleep or massage techniques and facial exercises help in rosaceous lymphedema antibiotic therapy is disappointing but low dose isotretinoin for 1 to 2 years should be done laser ablation of telangiectasias may reduce fluid load on the lymphatics in patient with orofacial granulomatosis topical or oral corticosteroids or immunosuppressants are the main stay of treatment among the immunosuppressants azathioprine thalidomide and mycophenolate mofetil are all used infliximab have also a role in treating the chronic orofacial granulomatosis now we are going to discuss the swelling swelling of genitalia and mons pubis genital lymphedema may affect the shaft of penis scrotum or mons pubis genitalia have an option of bilateral lymph node drainage so for swelling to occur drainage pathways to both inguinal node regions must fail or local genital lymphatics may become occluded the primary genital lymphedema gene mutations are identified which are geta 2 and fox c2 genes both primary and secondary causes and infections or other forms of local inflammation like dermatitis may cause swelling the compression of leg lymphedema through bandage or pneumatic compression pumps can push fluid up to the trunk and this also result in genital edema pathology all forms of pure lymphedema the pathology is the same that is increase dermal and subcutaneous thickening through fluid increase fat and fibrosis causative factors the primary lymphedema are because they, uh, there are four sub phenotypes which cause genital lymphedema and these are the m Amberger syndrome, lymph edema, disc uh, tichiasis syndrome, Hennekam syndrome, and Noonan syndrome. Most cases, that is sixty percent of genital lymph edema, will be caused by obliteration of upper thigh, inguinal, or iliac lymph vessels. One quarter of cases are due to obliteration of outflow lymphatics. from the scrotum and 15% are because of the reflux commonest cause of genital lymphedema and hydrocel worldwide is filariasis other secondary causes include bilateral inguinal lymph adenopathy or radiotherapy the granulomatous diseases like crohn's disease ano genital granulomatosis and extensive local inflammation and scarring as we see in hydradenitis 
suppurative. Genital swelling may occur as a part of heart failure, hypoalbuminemia, and inferior vena cable obstruction. Less common causes include tuberculous lymphadenitis and lymphogranuloma venarium and donovanaceus. The most pubis lymphedema is caused by local radiotherapy, obesity, local inflammatory disorders like Crohn's disease and hydroadenitis suppurativa. Clinical features. Development of swelling will be dependent on the underlying cause. Onset is usually insidious, uh, may be sudden with no obvious trigger. Infection of cellulitis may be a provoking cause. History of exposure to filariasis while traveling in endemic countries must be sought and primary cases invariably have one or more limb swelling at the time of onset of genital lymph edema. The primary lymph edema swelling may be present at birth or develops later in life. The genital lymph edemas are more common in male, probably because of anatomy and dependent nature of male external genitalia. You can see the edema of penis and edema of scrotum and mons pubis. The long-standing lymph edema caused thickening and hyperkeratosis of the overlying skin with production of papillomatosis. The most probably arise from lymphatic congestion with the dermal lymphatics in which the early stage appear as lymph blisters and later stage with fibrosis. With lymphatic blisters are filled with lymph. They are translucent, but when filled with chyle, the chyle is lymph mixed with fat droplets. Then these lymph blisters become opaque and white. When lymph blisters rupture, they release copious lymph and this uh, release of lymph is called as lymphoria, which, which mimicking incontinence or excessive sweating. Cellulitis attacks are common with genital lymphedema. Gram-negative infection should always be considered and inguinal lymph glands are often enlarged as a result of infection, both filarial or bacterial. Complication. Genital lymphedema is complicated by infection, that is cellulitis, or it results with contact dermatitis. Penile swelling interfere with micturation, sexual functions, and importance develop. Secondary blanopostitis may also occur. Uh, as far as the investigation is concerned, Filariasis must be excluded by complement fixation test or by nighttime blood smear if active filarial infection is likely. A skin biopsy is essential to diagnose a granulomatous disease or cancer infiltrating dermal lymphatics. Then MRI or CT scan is necessary to exclude the lymphatic obstruction. Lymphangiocentrography may be helpful in identifying lower limb lymphatic abnormalities. Management is by decongestive lymphatic therapy, which aim at reducing the swelling through a combination of massage and compression. Skin care should be scrupulous. Prophylactic antibiotics are necessary. Scrotal sling or harness is necessary to support and uh, uh, compression in the males. Second line includes surgical reduction, it may be straightforward and effective. Circumcision resolve the preputial swelling and redundant fourfold skin, foreskin. High frication or diathermy is best for lymphangiectasis. The topic now is an obesity related lymphedema. Obesity is a significant risk factor for lymphedema anywhere, maybe on arm, leg, or abdomen. And it is one of the strongest risk factor of breast cancer related lymphedema. Furthermore, the dieting improves arm lymphedema beyond that is possible through loss of subcutaneous fat alone from weight loss irrespective of diet use. A crude estimation of approximately 70% of morbidly obese patients have the chronic edema of the leg, leg as well. Pathophysiology. Fat and lymphatics appear to have a close relationship. High-density lipoproteins require transport through the lymphatics to return to the bloodstream. In a model of hypercholesterolemia, lymphatic functions was severely compromised. 
removal of cholesterol from peripheral tissue via reverse cholesterol transport requires lymphatic drainage. So fat deposition is a striking feature of lymphedema swelling and justification of liposuction as a treatment of lymphedema. Obesity impairs the lymphatic transport capacity and impaired lymphatic functions and promote adipose deposition. Lymph drainage requires movement and exercise to promote the flow, while in severe obese patients have worse physical functions and which all potentiates the lymphatic edema and lymphatic dysfunctions. So clinical features in grossly obese individuals is swelling which is insidious in onset and progressive. Acute cell cellulitis may alert the patients. More often, chronic redness and local pain and tenderness are indication of lipodermatosclerosis. As the legs swell, more extra weight further impairs mobility and further reduce the lymphatic drainage. So you exclude other causes of uh, uh, edema. The complication and comorbidities include egg ulcers, heart failures, overwhelming sepsis. Comorbidities include diabetes, sleep apnea syndrome, and right heart failure, all because of obesity. Prognosis is poor unless patient loses weight or become ambulant. First-line management include uh, management of heart failure, sleep apnea syndrome, then compression therapy for the multi-layer lymphedema, bandaging and treatment, pneumatic compression devices, Velcro wraps. Compression garments should be used until swelling is controlled and skin is returns to good condition. Exercise, if logically possible, should be done through walking or static cycling, elevation of leg when resting, treat active infection, wound care should be undertaken when necessary, emollients like 50-50 white soft liquid paraffin, liquid paraffin should be advised, and if there is hyperkeratosis of the skin, then 10% salicylic acid ointment should be advised. Second line is, uh, by rhetoric assessment and intervention, uh, by, by rhetoric assessment or intervention means the gastric loop or uh, gastric sleeve operations. Abdominal wall lymphedema is the next topic. If a skin and subcutaneous edema of lower abdominal wall, it is generated by ileoinguinal lymph drainage is compromised bilaterally within a pendulous obese abdomen. And diagnosis is difficult because soft tissues of abdominal wall make the pitting difficult to elicit. Furthermore, abdominal wall lymphedema may manifest uh, with more fat than fluid, making distinction from obesity very demanding. The puty orange skin is a helpful clinical sign and palpation of fluid gives a more solid feel than fat. Then abdominal wall lymphedema can develop following cancer treatment when in ileo and guanine lymph drainage is compromised. Non-cancer related lymphedema of abdominal wall is invariably due to obese abdominal paniculus or circumstances of excessive edema like heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, yellow nail syndrome. Pre-DPL mixed edema has been described as one of the cause of abdominal wall lymphedema. Oh. The patient may not perceive the mild abdominal wall edema with progression, there may be sensations of getting fatter with tightness and discomfort in affected area. There may be history of past cancer treatment of obesity and cellulitis. Pitting is usually demonstrated only over the anterior superior, uh, anterior superior iliac spine. Pinching a fold of lower abdominal skin will reveal thickening with heavier and solid feet. PD orange skin may be observed. More severe cases can develop marked hyperkeratosis, skin thickening, and papillomatosis, giving a characteristic warty cobblestone appearance of chronic lymphedema referred to elephantiasis uh, nostris, uh, nostris uh, tres verucosa. 
cellulitis is frequent occurrence and lipodermatosclerosis develop within the pendulous abdomen. So this is the pendulous abdomen. Investigation to exclude the cancers by using abdominal ultrasound, CT scan, skin biopsy may be necessary in severely obese, check for heart failure through BNP estimation, low plasma albumin, sleep apnea syndrome. Management is diuretic, which is of little help in lymphedema, but may be tried for short periods. Then for severe morbid obesity, um, BMI more than 50, bariatric intervention should be done. Antibiotics, manual lymph drainage, lymphatic drainage, and abdominal compression using binding or compression garment must be administered. Second line treatment include the menin slice, surgical aprenectomy, uh, with the, but the risk of infection in wound dehiscence is high. Cancer-related lymphedema we have discussed uh, till now many different causes of lymphedema which are due to cancers. Lymphedema is rarely a presenting feature of cancer unless the cancer is already advanced but it is more common consequence of cancer treatment and relapsed cancer. A few exceptions to this general rule is the lymphophilic tumors such as malignant acrine poroma, Kaposi sarcoma, lymph angiosarcoma, and inflammatory breast cancer. So these cancers attract lymphatic fluid. The cancer-related lymphedema usually results from cancer therapy. Surgical lymphadenectomy, radiation therapy, or chemo chemotherapy all contribute. Excessive lymph node involvement can compromise lymph flow, but other factors like venous obstruction and hypoproteinemia may also contribute. Recurrent cancer should always be considered as a cause of limb swelling, particularly if associated with pain. Full staging investigations should be undertaken in any cancer patient who develop new limb swelling. Carcinoma erysiploides, also called as lymph angiectasis, lymph, lymph angitis carcinomatosa, or carcinoma telangiectoides, or carcinoma n curase, occur when cancer cells infiltrate the dermal lymphatics. It represents a metastatic disease and bulk disease must be disease may be absent and therefore imaging may be normal. Epidemiology more than one in five women who survive breast cancer will develop arm lymphedema. Texane chemotherapy significantly contribute to BC uh, breast related cancer, breast cancer related lymphedema. The incidence of low limb lymphedema following radi radical hysterectomy is estimated to be 5 to 10 percent. The incidence after vulval cancer is about 28 percent. For prostate cancer, the rate is 0 to 10 percent after extended pelvic lymph adenectomy. After penile cancer treatment, the incidence of lymphedema is as high as 33 percent. After melanoma treatment, there is moderate lymphedema. Uh, that is increase in limb volume of more than 10%, occurring in 14% of those cases in which only sentinel lymph node is biopsied and increases to 30.4% if the total lymph node basin is dissected. The incidence of lymph edema is 28.8% following limb salvage for extremity soft tissue sarcoma. The clinical features are lymphedema following cancer treatment occur immediately after lymphadenectomy. Carcinoma erysiploides manifest clinically as fixed erythematous patch or plaque resembling cellulitis without fever. A network of lattice pattern of telangiectatic vessels represent the infiltrating dermal lymphatics. So this is telangiectatic or reticulate pattern of vessels due to um, due to infiltration of cancer within dermal lymphatics. Investigation of choice include uh, positron emission topograph tomography or PET scan 
or CT scan for relapsed cancer. A skin biopsy is investigation of choice for a skin metastasis. MRI uh, can determine swelling uh, if it is fluid or solid. Management. If active cancer is diagnosed, then oncology treatment is the priority. Cancer remission or stable, then lymphedema treatment like decongestive lymphatic therapy should be implemented. Swollen breast and breast lymphedema is again uh, mostly due to the breast cancer, especially the unilateral, unilateral breast edema. Or it may be caused by some infection like cellulitis or other carcinomas like angiosarcomas or inflammatory mastitis. Rarely, the medical causes like congestive cardiac failure, nephrotic syndrome, and by treatment with mTOR, which is the mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors. A change to breast conserving surgery from breast radical mastectomy with increasing use of therapeutic radiation to treat the breast cancer, the incidence of lymphedema localized to the breast has risen. The risk is higher in obese and in women with large breasts. Clinical features include breast swelling, which is observed immediately following axillary lymphadenectomy, particularly if seroma or wound infection has occurred. A seroma is misnomer here because it represents a collection of lymph not serum. Onset of swelling can be delayed for months or years, particularly when arising from radiation effects. Swelling can be triggered by attack of cellulitis. Pitting and pudy orange skin are most noticeable on the undersurface of the breast. Then symptoms of breast heaviness, swelling, indentation from bra, and sometimes pain and tenderness are all the features of unilateral breast lymphedema. Breast redness may feature indicating inflammation, usually secondary to cellulitis, radiation effect, or malignancy. You can see this breast lymphedema on this right breast. Prognosis, uncomplicated breast lymphedema usually settles with treatment and resolves over time. For investigation, breast ultrasound is sufficient to confirm the edema and exclude malignancy. MRI is an alternate. Breast skin or breast biopsy may be necessary if suspected malignancy. Management first line is treat the infection. Obesity should be addressed with weight reducing measures. Lymphedema treatment includes supportive bra. A sport bra is often the best. It is recommended that bra be worn both day and night in order to keep the breast uplifted, which overcomes the gravitational factors. Then massaging techniques are recommended such as manual lymphatic drainage therapy, kinesotaping, uh, taping, water immersion exercises like swimming or aerobics, although the evidence is limited. Mastectomy is the last resort. The last topic of today's lecture is massive localized lymphedema. This massive localized lymphedema is benign lymphoproliferative soft tissue overgrowth in morbidly obese patients, and it represents the gross lymphedema, usually confined to one area such as thigh and appearing like a tumor. Predisposing factors are obesity, filariasis, and recurrent infection. Presentation. It presents as area of lymphedema, becoming raised like a tumor, then under the effect of gravity becomes a polypoid or pendulous and feel heavy. Overlying skin is markedly thickened with lymphedema look that is cobblestone appearance and elephantiasis skin changes. Structure often appear lobulated and grow to considerable size. This is a localized edema of right thigh. Investigation include MRI, uh, demonstrate sharply demarcated pedunculated mass with fibrous septa surrounded by thick dermis. The only satisfactory management is surgical resection with reconstitution. So this brings to end of this long lecture and we have covered only half or less than half of the uh, chapter. So I may be able to complete this uh, chapter in the next lecture or maybe I 
need two lectures. So we'll see it next time. Till then, thank you very much for patient listening because it's always difficult to listen to such long lectures, but I can't stop this long lectures because otherwise it will go to many different lectures which will be uh, create further complications. So thank you very much and have a good day and goodbye.